Stanford University. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, the project, this EVP project, how it came into being, how we came up with the idea, and where it's gone since. I'm not going to talk so much about the technical content, but more just about the how the project has developed over the past five years. So there is, there's a huge team. It's just it's starting with me, and then I'll add all the people as, as uh, we go along. Um, so the genesis, as I'm sort of following the seven questions that we were asked to answer. So the genesis of the project and the team. So my research had, until I started this project, been on ductile cement-based materials, as Liz just mentioned. And um, I'd been looking at using these. They're fiber-reinforced cement-based materials. And on the very far right, you can see it's um, do I have a pointer? Is that a pointer? No, it doesn't matter. Um, on the very far right, so it's a, a sprayed on and to um, structures. I think, oh, thank you. Yeah, I know. I pressed it, but it didn't. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technology. Okay. Um, the, it's uh, sprayed on to a wall to prevent this kind of a failure, which prevents that kind of a collapse in an earthquake. And there's a lot of these um, unreinforced masonry structures around the world. And a lot actually just came down in Indonesia. So um, I was very interested in these um, cement-based materials and how they can be used to protect structures, particularly for earthquakes. But I was also curious about um, sustainability and environmental impact of materials, and I learned that these cement-based materials, or I learned a little bit more about them, and for instance, found out that um, CO2 emissions, the global CO2 emissions, about 5% of global CO2 emissions are from cement manufacture alone. Uh, it's roughly 5%. And, and that's because you have to heat up the limestone and clay, so there's a lot of CO2 emitted from that heat. And then there's also CO2 driven off of um, the calcium carbonate uh, to make the, CA, the calcium oxide to make the cement. So the, that, again, 5% of global CO2 emissions seems like a lot. And then also I did know from concrete materials that trying to recycle them, you're usually downcycling. So eventually it's all going to end up in a landfill. It's hard to get a, the same product again when you recycle it. So these were sort of negative environmental impact things. So I was curious and I kept looking around and I found that embodied energy for building material, fabrication, production, as well as demolition um, is about 13% of U.S. energy demand which also seemed like a big number. And then the biggest number that surprised me was that construction and demolition debris is about 40% of our U.S. landfill volume. And that was really surprising to me. Um, I know there's a lot of space in the U.S., but in other countries there's not as much. But uh, that was really a large number. And the, the student that was very interested in this right around the time that I was becoming interested in this topic actually manages apartment complexes in Palo Alto and Menlo Park. And she gave me these pictures, which are the... Um, Trying to tear, or they're tearing out and renovating just one apartment building, or I think just one apartment even, um, and all of that is going to a landfill, and that's just one little apartment building in Palo Alto. So it's a good demonstration of how much junk is going into the landfill. Um, so again, my, most of my experience had been in concrete, but in composite, so fiber reinforced, but um, that wasn't something that um, could degrade ever in a landfill, but or or be easily replaced, concrete and steel. Um, but what I did find was this uh, material called bio, or in the literature a little bit, bio-based materials, biocomposites. Never, but they've mostly been used, so it's some sort of a, um, a plant-based or, uh, in this case, plant-based polymer uh, from soy oil, soybean oil, and then a natural plant fiber is combined to make some sort of composite. And people have been looking at these for like electronics, casings, computers, or car doors. This is actually... Um, a car door, and Ford was even looking at something like this in the 30s. And, but no one had really been looking at it for construction. And since there was this 40% of our landfill volume is construction debris, I thought, well, that would be a good place to have something that could actually biodegrade. And of that 40%, of the construction and demolition debris, somewhere about 40% of that could be replaced, is, is some kind of a wood or non-structural product that could be replaced with a bio-based composite. So it's also a pretty significant volume. So that was what was interesting to me was that, that there, there existed this material, this bio-based composite, but no one had looked at it for structural or non-structural components yet, or not in much detail. The other thing that was interesting to me was that, that there, wasn't, there weren't a whole lot of studies on the actual biodegradability of the material. So they would talk about them being bio-based um, and how they might be used in the electronics industry or sports or something, cars. Um, and that some people had done some composting studies. But I didn't know much about biodegradation. So I went to an expert in my department, actually, in the environmental engineering side, Perry McCarty, to talk about biodegradation. And he pointed out to me 
that if you put something in a wet landfill, anaerobic landfill, it can actually degrade to methane, and the methane could be sold as a fuel. So this was nice, because then you could have a, a product at the end of the useful service life of the material. So that got me very excited. And, and I thought, OK, well, now we're going to have to see if it really can biodegrade, because I couldn't find much literature on that. Um, and, and so we formed the team. And that's kind of the genesis of the team for the Woods project. And I, having been in cement composites, was comfortable doing composites, but didn't know much about polymers. So I asked George Springer if he would join. He's an AeroAstro Emeritus professor who's a fiber-reinforced polymer expert. And then Perry McCarty and um, Craig is actually a former student of Perry's, is the bio, are the biodegradation experts. So that's how we started. And um, the other, so that finding a material that might biodegrade because of the large landfill volume was one interest of mine. But and that's the one that kind of makes more sense when you explain it to people. But really, kind of underlying it all, I really wanted to work with an environmental engineer. <laughs> um, I can't. That doesn't. There's not much explanation for that. But <laughs> um, just because I've been in civil and environmental engineering departments, two different ones. I was at Cornell for five years before coming here, and I'm on the built environment side. And here at Stanford, we have our civil engineering department and environmental engineering department has three divisions. And I'd never worked with anyone on the water side or the atmosphere energy side. And I thought, well, we're all in one department. There must be some common ground. You know, so that, that was the other impetus for it. Um, and the two things came together, finding the biodegradable composites and, and then the fact that the biodegradation experts happened to be on the water side of our department. So that was nice. So we received the Woods funding and were able to hire um, Molly Morse right away. So our team expanded a little bit. And then actually two NSF fellowship students were interested in the topic as well. They all had structural engineering background, and Molly and Allison has fully become an environmental engineer, and Molly kind of was schizophrenic during her PhD and did both <laughs> environmental engineering and, and structural, and Sarah's structural. But so we, right from the beginning, we had a pretty big team, so that was actually very helpful um, in terms of keeping everybody engaged. And so we started doing the research. One of the questions we asked was, how did you get the members to work together? Well, I found that the students just did this naturally, and maybe you've found this as well. Um, they had to figure out, they all needed to deal with composites, so they all had to figure out how to make them. They were going to Trader Joe's and buying soybean oil and trying to polymerize it in a chemical engineering lab. And then they had to go to San Jose to get sludge to biodegrade the stuff, and that's a messy process. Dangerous, you don't want it exploding in your car, <laughs> um, which has happened apparently. Um, they had to. <laughs> heard of that. Um, the, um, they had to find space to work in each other's labs, and students don't get as ruffled about that. So that was actually not so bad. They they uh, shared space a lot, and so that I, we found that to work really pretty seamlessly. They they worked together a lot. In terms of the faculty um, working together, we would meet with the students. They would usually try to have a common denominator. So um, there would be two faculty members and a student. It, it's kind of inefficient if the student sees one faculty member and then another without both faculty in the room, just because decisions get made that don't make as much sense. Uh, but so we would try to, I mean, it's mostly me going to all the meetings, um, which was fine. And then the other big thing that we did was work on small and large proposals together. And that's where we really kind of learned how the other person worked and what they were thinking. And I learned more about their field, and they could learn more about what I was doing, and we had ideas. And I think that was what kind of got us to stick together. Um, pretty well. But it's never been such a big issue um, in this case with the team that you'll see as it grows. The, um, I think just because everyone has a really strong interest in the topic, so we were lucky in that way. And um, each faculty member had a student, and I think that was really pretty important. I have worked on collaborative projects where I didn't have a student myself, and it was harder to stay engaged and, and to, um, uh, to advise the student um, when you don't have your own that's working with the other student. That's just what I found. So we were very lucky that the NSF fellowship students wanted to join as well. And I'll talk, there's one more thing that um, comes under this topic. I'll talk about that a little later. Another thing we have to talk about is the success of the project. And I think it's been quite successful because we have the research, and I'll explain how, but the research has led to some new discoveries and significant expansion of the scope. And so more people are being coming involved, and we've been able to get outside funding. Um, additional seed funding from Stanford, as well as the external funding, has supported this expansion a lot. So I think it's been successful in that sense. Personally, for me, it's created a lot of excitement and passion for what I do. Um, so I'm very thankful to this, <laughs> the uh, birth of this project. Um, partly because of the topic, because I really like working on the topic, but also the collaborations. I just really, really have enjoyed being able to do collaborative research, and it's really quite easy to do at Stanford, I think. 
And um, I've also been collaborating more in another area, in the earthquake engineering area, with people at different universities. And that, so both of those um, branches of my research have really been um, enjoyable for me. Uh, so that, I think that is a success, at least personally, for me. Um, so the first aha in the project, the first successful thing um, that came about was that, um, so we'd been focusing on, you know, making, finding some polymers that were bio-based, and there were several. There's cellulose acetate matrix, um, a soybean oil-based matrix, matrix being the plastic part of the composite, and then PHB, it's a polyhydroxybutyrate, it's a class of polymers um, under a class called polyhydroxyalkanoates, and it's grown in bacteria. And so we had all these three different ones that we were looking at. And so we were thinking, well, what are the mechanical properties? Is it good enough to replace wood or plastic in construction? And will it biodegrade? So we did all these initial studies um, with our seed funding. And the aha moment was when Allison and Craig realized that when we get to the landfill and make the methane, we could sell it as a fuel, or you could actually use the methane and feed it to other bacteria. There were certain bacteria that would eat methane, basically, and store the carbon in the methane as polymer, the way we store fat. <laughs> and so you can plump up these bacteria in different ways, different clever ways. Craig is um, amazing at coming up with clever ways to do these things and, um, and create um, the PHP that way. So then you're really closing the loop. So you use the material, you biodegrade it, you make new material that's just as good as the first material was. So it's not downcycling, but really fully recycling. So this was really, really exciting. Um, <laughs> and uh, and because um, most people that are making PHB, there had been a lot of research on it, but for medical applications, since it biodegrades, they'd use it in the body um, as a some sort of a biodegradable device. Um, but to do that, the it was being fed a sugar, like often corn, and it was done in a very sterile environment. This can be messy. This is a wet landfill, or it could be a wastewater treatment plant. It could be a digester on a farm. All sorts of just messy. It doesn't, construction doesn't matter. They don't care where it comes from. Um, it's not going in a body. So, so anyway, so it was really, um, really, this was great. This was the big, the big thing. And um, that focus on PHB, as I mentioned, we've been looking at a lot of different polymers, was also um, fine on all the other respects of that loop because, uh, you know, we've been testing different matrices in tension to see in other uh, stress states to see how it would do in construction. Um, and it was fine. It was one of just like good enough, basically, in mechanical testing. And then also, this is the biodegradation testing Molly did. This is volumes of biogas, so it's um, uh, methane and CO2. And the bugs really liked the PHP hemp. Um, well, they all had hemp in them. <laughs> California bugs, I guess. I, and um, the, but they, the PHB went really fast. So within 10, these are tiny samples, but still, relative to the other two materials, the soybean, which actually had some petroleum product in it, and the cellulose acetate, the, the PHB one went really fast. So those were all great reasons for, you know, it was going to be working here and it was going to be working here, the PHB. So we've pretty much just focused now on PHB um, for closing this loop. So that was kind of the first aha. Now then, the next thing was that, so Craig is down here biodegrading things and making PHB, and I'm over here trying to figure out how to use them in construction. What we didn't have was um, somebody who could help us actually take this PHB and make it workable to make into these products. And then the other issue that we recognized right away was that, well, plant fibers, they're meant to soak up water. Um, and so they're going to soak up a lot of moisture and water, and that really degraded the properties of our composites, the moisture absorption. So we needed someone to help us with that. And very fortunately, Kurt Frank um, was interested in joining the project for that. He was really hard to get a hold of. But um, then we found out from a student that he answers email at 7 in the morning. <laughs> so we'd get up early and then write to him, and then, well, then he would join. <laughs> so we tracked him down. Um, and that uh, was great. A very has been a, a fantastic collaboration and essential to really work on that, that whole closed loop. And with Kurt then, well, we, we wrote one proposal. It was unsuccessful, but it was extremely successful for getting us to work together. He, I work until late at night. He gets up at 5 in the morning. So there's no issues of version control. <laughs> I'd send him my version at midnight, and he'd wake up, and I'd, I'd wake up, and his version, new version would be ready for me to work on. And just went around the clock. <laughs> it worked really well. Um, and we also did that last year. I was on sabbatical in the Netherlands that time. Difference worked well, too. So, um, but that, that really kind of got us to understand what the other person does and, and work together. And so we wrote a proposal for the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center to make the PHB, this is a PLA, but it, to make PHB foams 
to make more energy efficient construction. Oh, I actually have props too, like the social scientist. <laughs> so to make these um, like composites that have a foam um, inside, and that's for thermal insulation, um, and um, and also making it lighter. So we had a project on that, and that then we were able to hire two new students. We finally let a man join the team. <laughs> um, and um, so that was expanding. And then more recently, we were received a small amount of funding from the um, Woods Institute Sustainable, Sustainable Built Environment Initiative and um, have had Lynn Hildeman join, who was also on the previous project you just heard about, indoor air quality. So now we're taking the PHB inside the bacteria and trying to make a glue out of it. Um, and, the, and that could be used in construction applications. And particularly with these um, thermal or these energy efficient construction, you tend to have less or more problems with indoor air quality because your building is more sealed. Um, and so the, the idea of, well, how much is off-gassing will there be here, or if we use a glue, how much off-gassing and how dangerous will that be? It's really hard, actually, to turn this into a glue, um, but we have learned more about just the off-gassing of the material in general under um, heat uh, with Lynn. So then um, the, coming back to that question of how to get the team members to work together, I was very lucky. I don't think this is going to happen to everybody, but I was actually just given a lab space in the new Y2E2 building. They said, would you like a space? I said, sure. <laughs> and, um, and we've turned it into this bio-based composites lab. And it's really a shared space. Um, and so in green is what we do in there. Um, so I, there's a large oven for making samples, weatherometer for weathering, testing, thermal resistance. Um, there's a controlled temperature room and respirometer that measures the biogas from degradation that, that Craig's students use. And then with Kurt, we've um, done some equipment matching with the School of Engineering for an extruder, and he now has a supercritical CO2 extractor. Um, and so we can kind of do all parts of the cycle. Over in the environmental engineering labs, are actually making the PHB, but it's right across the hall, so then we can bring it in, extract it, use it, degrade it, all in that lab space. It's not huge, but it's really it's nice that we can actually do all of those things. And so this is also just to say, in terms of working together, you know, we've been able to share this space, so each of our students has access and uses it in different ways. Um, but also, it's just been wonderful how open everyone's been in other labs for um, the students to use them. So we've been able to go to the Aero Astro Lab and use their composites lab equipment. In the Bloom Center, we have structural engineering lab equipment. The Center for Polymer Interfaces and I think Molecular Assemblies that Kurt Frank was in charge of in the environmental lab. So we've, it's not just in this lab, but everywhere. I mean, we're kind of all over campus using what, what we have to use. But that's really also been a very positive um, experience and having that central location. OK, and then I think probably the biggest success of, of this has actually been in an area that's not mine, but is just you know, c getting to this idea of making methane into polymer um, means that you could make these plastics for any application. And so um, it's not necessarily construction related. And so the, the loop has kind of expanded in that. So I was, I'm on that green, I'm on the green circle here, right? So anaerobic fermentation, so from wastewater treatment or, or a, a landfill. Um, then you make the PHA, which, or PHB, add the fibers. You have the composites, construction products. Then you bring them back and you degrade them. But you can also just stop here and come over here and make just plastic resins and plastic products. So bottles and packaging materials, and um, there's a company that makes golf tees and I mean, all sorts of, you know, anything, plastic bags, anything that's um, made from plastic. And it has to, you know, match the properties of the PHB. But basically, there's a whole new loop um, in there. And so as Craig likes to put it, it's a mini carbon cycle where we just go from methane to plastic to methane to plastic to methane to plastic, <laughs> which is really nice, sequestering the, the methane um, in that way. So I think that's been one of the biggest uh, successes of the project. In terms of external funding, um, which I think is part of, I guess, the success of one of the intentions of the Woods Institute. So Craig was um, able to get about $1.4 million from the California EPA focusing on bottles. Um, that's from the Department of Conservation within the Cal EPA. Um, and that's for making plastic into bottles. And Kurt's students have been able to make it um, translucent. Um, it's a little bit yellowish, but uh, it's, at least you can see through it. So that that's, uh, was exciting. Um, Kurt, Frank, and I, um, with Craig as well, received an NSF grant to focus on the composite design. It's a sort of orthogonal objectives, making it work in service and be moisture resistant, but then getting it to degrade anaerobically out of service. So we have some sort of ideas, both at his level of interfaces and my level of composite design, um, on how to solve that problem. Um, through the development office in SOE, um, we're pursuing support from large companies. Again, that's more focused on plastics. 
and um, and then there's a lot of new initiatives on green building through NSF and DOE that we, we can go after with this um, with these topics. So uh, the last question was the changes in the way I work. Um, I think I you know one simple thing I have gotten new ideas for proposal writing by being able to work with these colleagues from different areas. Um, I've been exposed to different styles of rigor and thesis formulation and qual exam, quals exams, PhD defenses, technical writing, which has been nice um, and uh, invigorating, as you say. Um, I now have a very strong preference for collaborative work. I really love it. Um, and I, uh, I still have a lot to learn. I mean, one thing about it is that I've sort of resigned myself to knowing that I'm going to be ignorant in every research meeting I go into. Um, but I really I like it so much. It's just I've really enjoyed it. It's been very um, inspiring um, to be working with these other experts. So, and then, um, of course, it's all about the people. And just to end with the image of our growing green team, um, this is also, I think, there's also some luck involved in finding the right people that you're going to match with um, to get the project to work. But, uh, but the, I don't know, the enthusiasm and expertise on this campus is just amazing. So it shouldn't be too hard to do. literature review as just talking to contractors <laughs> so in the building yeah. industry so but it's a good question exactly yeah it's they don't want to have to change their ways <laughs> so um, and I've learned a lot about that also just through some cement uh, work that I've done but for instance our material so we have these pieces that look like wood but they're heavier so right away they're like oh and then they're always the first question is can you hammer into it nail into it screw it and all that sort of thing and it Hammers, or, uh, nails hold better, but it's harder to drive a nail. So those kind of things are not going to be acceptable, and that's something that we're working on, is how to lighten it, to um, make it less dense, which is also going to help with that workability. Um, so in general, you want something that's going to um, not require them to use new tools, I would say. So, so you sort of done the analysis to say, what, what would it take for them to use it? What are the other, uh, are there other impediments to use? And, um, Full cost. Okay. Huge one. Yeah. And I don't know what kind of regulation is that. But anyways. So no, that's a very good question. So that's another one like with thermal. So I think we've been talking to an architect, or like John Barton in our, our department now, um, and other architects, and there's issues, uh, there are issues, and whenever I talk to an engineer, they always are like, what's the thermal resistance? Well, engineers work on larger scale product <coughs> projects. And so they're with large assemblies like this, and so there's a certain fire rating that's required for the walls. In a residential house, you don't have as stringent there's like five different layers of construction um, quality, kind of. And so in residential construction, where this could actually make a pretty big impact, you don't have as stringent rules on the thermal. So we're working with Lynn, and we're going to try to work with a fire test expert um, in Michigan and stuff like that. But, but there should be markets where some of these, are, these uh, requirements are less stringent. Yeah, but we're not going to build tall buildings with it, or movie theaters, or yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.